This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. My name is Alan Katz. And I'm Gil Adler. One of the actresses that we worked with a number of times when we were doing Tales from the Crypt and uh, the, the, the feature films uh, was Sherry Rose. And the strange thing is we hired Sherry three times. I think no one else it. ever got three different episodes. Yeah. And the, the, the first time we hired her, actually Billy Friedkin hired her in the room. Sherry will tell you the story for the episode on a dead man's chest of Tales from the Crypt. The second time, as we'll describe, we actually wrote a part and we had no one else in mind but Sherry Rose. And it's it's one of my favorite episodes. I don't know about you, Gil. It's one of my favorites. It's called Only Skin Deep. Then we, when we did the first Tales from the Crypt feature film, Demon Knight, there was a part that we, we hired Sherry for. And unfortunately, most of her role ended up on the cutting room floor. But but we thought of Sherry for it, and, and I don't think anyone else was in our mind. We Had we continued uh, working together, I'm, I'm sure we would have found something else to do for Sherry Rose. She is an amazingly talented actress, but in addition to that, she's a very, very talented uh, producer, writer, uh, and she's got an amazing story. Sherry knows everybody. everybody. And a director. I, I, and, and, and a director as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and her, 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 her arc of going from Tales from the Crypt, and we knew her all those years ago, to what she's done since is quite remarkable. Wow. I think it'll be very enlightening for some of our, our younger female uh, directors, writers, actors, producers. Um, it's really an, an, an exceptional episode. Her theme is be prepared. Uh, I think we should let her talk for herself, however. Truly, here's Sherry Rose, everybody. I think you're the only act, actor or actress that we hired more than twice. We hired you three times. Yay. And, uh, Thank you. I, for one, want to know why. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. I just said well, yes. That is the point of this conversation. There's, there's, there's something from the first time that we hired you. There was just... Oh, so yeah, there was something about you that that uh, I don't know. It, it worked for the for the sensibility that that we were telling stories in. Well, I think the the first one uh, with William Freakin, he um, he really pretty much uh, hired me in the room, which you know is not really normal. And um, we will kind of we will get to this. Okay, okay, but I'm saying I think that's like he he allowed me some freedoms and taught me some things that I think allowed me to be more fearless. I love this. <laughs> I love this, and we will we will visit this heavily. But first, hey, you know the the person who walked into that room was a very particular person. You know what we what we want to talk about first is how did we get there? You you started out in Connecticut. I was yes, I started out in Connecticut. I was born one of the one of the fattest babies in Hartford Hospital, is what I'm told. You I was a very big that, baby. You were a big baby. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then I um lived in grew up in Connecticut. I started working on picking tobacco at 10 and had paper routes and babysat and ran a vegetable farm and do they grow tobacco in Connecticut or had they do? Yes, they do. Oh. And vegetables and all kinds of things, lots of farms. And the peak season is summer, so you get to work in the summer. I have goats now, goats and rabbits, and everyone's a rescue over here. So we all rescue. I have a lot of rescue animals. So we have uh, cats, dogs, fish, rabbits, chickens, goats. You're halfway to, uh, to an omnivore's feast. Yeah, I love being around nature and animals. It's my favorite. Uh all right, so Connecticut. Uh, yep. So then we, my family moved down to Florida. My sister got uh, got into University of South Florida. So my mother, father, and myself, we lived in a '66 Volkswagen van. So we moved from a very small place in Connecticut. <laughs> Connecticut sounds very affluent, but I grew up in a trailer, 
and then lived in a van. Um, I wish I still had that 66 Volkswagen van because it's probably it's worth a lot more money now. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very cool, you know, and it was great because that's the year I was born. So I was like, oh, this year's this this truck is the same age as me. Yeah, this van. Yeah. Um, so uh, then we moved down there and I proceeded then to go to USF as well yeah. uh, as an engineer student. All my family was in accounting. My dad, my mom, my mom worked at a bank. You have, um, my, you, you have a, a, a two degrees. You, what, what, no, you have a, a, a joint major. You have electrical engineer, engineering and theater. Yeah. Well, so what happened was I really didn't want to go to engineering school. That wasn't the plan. Um, it just was a way to get into college. And when I was young, I was very good at math. I'm still good at math. Um, and, you know, I just what I loved about math was that it doesn't ever lie. Like two and two is never going to really equal five. You know, it's always going to equal four. I always I found that fascinating. You know, it was just like, wow, that's it's always going to be that. Like you're never your answer is always going to get be correct. The you know, um, if you do it right. People, the problem is that people can make numbers lie. That well, yes. <laughs> That's not here to there. Yeah, my um, high school guidance counselor. She kind of shepherded me and said, you know, why don't you just go this route and get get into school? You'll get, you know, you'll get it paid for, and let's let's try this. Hey, so I did. I graduated. Practical, incredibly yeah. practical. Yeah, and then it, part of the engineering aspect. This is kind of boring part of the story, however, but. I the, parts. <laughs> one of the things I had to do was put in the soundboard into the second second theater. And while I was there, they were rehearsing a play down below. And I kept kind of doing that and thinking, well, that looks way funner. How, now, wait, wait, now, why would you think that's a boring part of the story? That's, I, I guess because I've said it enough. I don't know. That is good God. You took us right up to the entry point of, of how you got to us. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. well, that, makes a, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense because between the engineering and the theater, so here she can act. And then when the lights go out and they have trouble with the electricity, yeah. they know where to turn to. They don't have to go. Yeah. Actually, there were some times where stuff blew and I was like, oh, I, I know how to get it. I know yeah. I know where to I know where, where to run it. I know where to reroute it. I know what to do, <laughs> you know, and I've always had such an uh, uh, inquisitive mind. I always like to know how things work, how the back ground of something works i always want like to know why we can eat a food or why like a machine works the way it does like who was the first person that tried a, a kumquat or like who was that first person that ate something and said oh this is edible i wonder yeah. who, who first looked at a lobster and said that's food yeah like and how do we cook it and how do we crack it open you know yeah. it's just like who was that first person and why do we, you know and what else have we not tried yet? You know, is there anything else we haven't tried yet? Um, I'm always curious about that. Every time I'm in nature, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if someone's eaten that. A lot are of my you, friends are like, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Are, are you by nature an adventurous eater? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. When I was acting, I got to live all over the world. Yeah. You know, I lived in Thailand and Peru and Haiti and Santo Domingo, really. But, you know, um, so I kind of had to have a palate for you know, I couldn't just eat rice everywhere, you know. Yeah. That would get tired. That would get tired. Yeah. So, um, so I put in the theater. And so I auditioned for a play. At the same time, I started doing a little modeling. And in that modeling, I got a uh, job on, um, uh, what's it called? Bush Gardens Adventure Island. So I was the yaya girl that came down the pool and jumped out of the water and went yaya, you know, uh, get your yayas in the Wawa at Adventure Island. Oh wow! Oh wow! Which, the yaya girl, which afforded me to get a SAG card, and and then they paid me a lot of money, mm. and Good. I couldn't believe it. I was like. For like nine hours, you guys are going to pay me that much money. And then I don't go back again. And then you're going to keep sending me money. What did you make on, on that first? I don't remember, but I grew up really poor. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lot for me. And I had all, and I was working through college. I was working at Chi Chi's, the home of the chimichanga. So, you know, I'd answer the phone. Hi, Chi Chi's, home of the chimichanga. You know, what would you like? I mean, so you know, it was paying more than that. And I got like, you know, a, a Budweiser commercial or Coors Light. You know, I started getting these commercials 
And at the same time, I ended up auditioning for a small part in a play called Female Transport. And I had to play this character, Madge, who was the oldest character. So they put old age makeup on me and they blackened out my teeth. And I ended up, the part ended up getting bigger. And I got some write-ups in the local, you know, like the Tampa Bay Tribune or whatever times or whatever it was at the time, you know, talking about my acting. And I thought, well, that's odd. So it was kind of like, oh, I'm kind of good at this naturally. And on the other side, I'm, I can make some money doing it. And what I was doing, I didn't like, mm. you know, I didn't enjoy I, I was the only girl in my in my study group, you know, for classes, you know, doing a differential equation for hours at a time was not that fun. You know, it's like strangely. Yeah. So everyone else seemed to be having more fun than that. Um, and, so, yeah, that's how it changed. And And the theater in that world, it's it's a community. Yeah. You felt like taken care of and. Everyone's taking care of each other's makeup and and hair and and wardrobe and that type of stuff was old. It was the eighteen hundreds, and so you're blacking out each other's teeth, and it is just such a great sense of camaraderie. And you know, everyone's there to to build something together, right? So we're all there not competitively, but to make everything better and great. Mm -hmm. And I was that person that I memorized everybody's lines. You know, I was just like if somebody would drop a line, I'd kind of pick it up and. You know, I, I, I always, I was a straight A student and I always still like to be a straight A student. I'm kind of that annoying person. Um, I kind of like, I've gotten my real estate license and my notary license in my days. And if I got 97, I go and talk to somebody like, what did I miss? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm confused. Cause I thought I knew that, you know, I'm that person, but it just goes that I want to get it right. And I want to know what I did wrong so I can fix it. So this this all would would suit you later as a producer. Yes, I think so. Though I made a lot of mistakes as a producer, a lot of mistakes. Ooh, oh, hey, we, we could do a whole podcast about it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a question, Gil? No, no, I said we all do as Oh yeah, 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 we all make those mistakes. Yeah. All right. What brought you out to Los Angeles? So I did Miami Vice um, as an actress, and then I did a movie called Summer Job for Sony. And I started working more, moved to Miami, started working more. I had to make a decision to leave college and kind of continue this idea or, you know, just see what Tampa, Florida or Miami held for me. Um, and I just realized that I, you know, I didn't want to be a big fish in a small pond and I just wanted to give it a shot. I didn't know anybody. I knew maybe two people, but, you know, uh, but I just kind of wanted to try it. So I packed up a U-Haul and I put my, uh, the trailer on the back with my car and I, I put on Guns N' Roses, um, Appetite for Destruction and I started driving <laughs> and I think I had $1,400 to my name that time and, uh, got an apartment right off, um, Hollywood Boulevard on Poinsettia. Did you know anybody out here? Yeah, I knew who I write with now, Scott Taylor and Perry Lister and Billy Idol. But I met, I didn't know them. I didn't know Perry and Billy very well, but I knew Scotty very well. Mm -hmm. And that week that I got there is the first week I met Steve Jones, who became one of my best, bestie friends. What, what, what year are we talking about here? Like 1989. Okay. 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 All right. So 1989, you move into WeHo. Uh, yeah, it wasn't even WeHo, it's Hollywood, because it was like Poinsettia and Hollywood. Like, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, okay, all right, all Gray right. and Fairfax. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And I think okay, WeHo Justin. starts. WeHo adjacent. Yeah. Right. Jason. Um, yeah, not in a nice apartment and not in a very good, I mean, I, you, I could just walk to the Denny's, you know, or the Wendy's. I mean, it was, you know, it's not a great little neighborhood, but up the way is where can, uh, uh, the canyons are, where everyone goes yeah. hiking and stuff. So it, it's right in it, you know. Um, but right away, I got a job. I got a job in uh, Thailand, so I left immediately. Uh, I got a job in gold. In gold, we trust with uh, Jam Michael Vincent and Sam Jones. But I had a huge role in it, and I got that movie because another girl dropped out, so I was second choice. And um, this was my my uh, introduction into. Well, I don't know if I should say this, but. 
Go for it. For me, it was a turning point. It was my introduction of a lot of people come to Hollywood for a lot of different reasons. And they want you to get the gold and the MIS. One or the other. I knew that I loved creating characters and I loved telling stories. And there was other people that wanted to be either famous or just make the money or, you know, have a lifestyle. And I knew that wasn't me. And when I got put on hold for this part, the, another girl got it. And the boyfriend basically said to her, I'll buy you a car or do something. You don't don't go. I need you with me. So they called and they said, is your passport in order? Can you fly tomorrow? I was like, yes, yes. Can you fly to Thailand tomorrow? Yes. And I got off the plane and they walked me right onto set. And thank God I was young enough where I wasn't worried about puffy eyes and, you know, all that stuff. But um, Jan Michael Vincent just reamed me. He's like, I don't want to talk about this and I don't want to talk about that. And I go, I don't even know who you are, dude. I was just been on a plane for 14 hours. I haven't slept. I've had some cocktails on the plane. And now they're handing me like six pages of dialogue. So I'm going to focus on this. And later you can tell me about what I'm supposed to talk about. Because apparently there was a bunch of stuff about him in the news. But at that time, it wasn't like you couldn't it wasn't there was no Google. Like, I didn't know anything that was going on with this guy's life. But apparently he thought it was relevant to tell me and I didn't care. But then we became I, fast I friends. Recall, vaguely, vaguely stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, who knows, who cares? He's a great actor, you know, he was, and Sam Jones was great to work with. And and it was it was so fun, fun to, we were there for three months. It was so fun to see Thailand, you know? We went to Phuket and Phi Phi Island and it was great. I loved it. Always nice to travel on other people's money. Yeah. It's the best. People feed you, like they give me a place to stay, they feed me. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's uh, it, it it's it's one of the perks of this stupid way to make a, a living. Yeah. But then the movie's producers ran afoul of Thai immigration, which held up the film's release for years, which screwed up everything for Sherry and her big break. Because it was a pretty big budget movie, big right. action. I mean, helicopters, shoot ups, armies, tankers, scuba diving. You know, it was it was big. Something got held up with customs, and I'm not sure what all that happened. So I, I've had a nice, I would say a nice slow burn. And there's been a few things that probably could have put my career over the next echelon or edge or whatever that didn't happen. One thing that had happened, it was on a, on a weekend, an unlawful entry that I was in came out. Tales from the Crypt came out and Dream On came out all in the same weekend. My manager handled... Um, this musician who got arrested that weekend, suddenly her energy and everything was with that. And he was a bigger star than I was on that Monday came in CAA and a few people called, Oh, who's this girl? I saw her over the weekend. I saw her on this. I saw her on that. You know, there wasn't that momentum. And I also can say for myself that I get a little bored um, where after I made that movie, Me and Will, in it opened the Women in Film series for Sundance, and mm -hmm. I got signed at William Morris and all that, I decided I wanted to start a punk band instead of make another movie. So I started a punk band called Little Morphine Annie, and Steve Jones played a little on it. Matt Sorum, the drummer from Guns N' Roses, played on it for me. And I suddenly was like, oh, I'm going to do this. And everyone was kind of like, you kind of got to strike while the fire is hot. And I'm like, well, I don't know what I want to do. So I want to do this now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do, I kind of get a little um, antsy. Like I get antsy. Like, oh, I want to try this now. I want to do this now. I want to try this now. Mm -hmm. So I follow my my heart and passion, not necessarily my direction. For better or worse. Yep. Do you, do you regret not... Uh, not Following I, as a as a director path because we, we will we will get to to Will and me I I I I watched it. Oh, I, thank you. I, I just I just watched it on Tubi and we will we will link to it because everyone listening to this podcast or watching us on on our YouTube channel you should watch the, this movie. It really it's it's terrific. It's it's a oh. it's a really lovely piece of work. We'll get to it. We'll I try not to live with regrets. Yeah. I don't 
I don't kind of look back and go, oh, God, I should have, would have, could have. I mean, I also had a big opportunity with, it's called me and Will. A lot of people switch it with Will, Will, and, Will and me, understandably, but it's called me and Will. And oh, okay. Cassie, I, I, I apologize. I think I saw. No, no, no worries. No worries. Uh, Cassie and Elways at the time was repping the film and he set up a screening for Oliver Stone. So we went to Oliver Stone's office and screened the movie and he wanted me to change the ending. And he watched the whole movie. We watched it with him. And uh, I drove home and I said, I may not ever be able to write, direct, produce and star in another movie. And I don't want anyone else to mandate what my ending should be. What kind of ending? He, he wanted the, he, he, he just kept live? saying, he kept doing this. The bad girl should live. The bad girl needs to live. I'll put my name on it, but you got to reshoot it and the bad girl has to live. And I'm like, yeah, that's not really the story I'm trying to tell. You know, I mean, it's hard to talk back to Oliver Stone. I mean, he's Oliver Stone, right? Yeah. But I have to have my own opinion. I have to live by my own creed. And um, so I said no to that. Sometimes I regret that only because it could have been a sacrificial lamb so that I could have gone on to maybe make another film mm. um, sooner. Um, and I'm going to, I've been writing still, and I've now started raising money again to start making movies again, which is exciting for me. And I had to put that on hold for a little while because I became a mom and that was important to me to be available to my son. And uh, that was where I chose to put my time and energy. So, but now he's off at NYU and he's at film school at Tisch. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank yeah, that's you. Great. So he's flown out of the coop. And does he does he want to write or direct or does he know yet? I think he wants to write and direct. I think that's his his focus. He's doing some modeling and he's done some acting. Hmm. Uh, he's a good looking kid. But I think his focus is on writing and directing. He's got a really good eye for directing and he writes very quickly. Um, I introduced him to Final Draft when he was probably 16, and he just picked it up so quick. He's like, "Oh, drop down over here, over here." And I'm like, "Oh, okay. You don't need. Guess you don't need my help." <laughs> you know. I frankly, I'm, I'm a screenwriter. I'm a screenwriter guy. I, I have Final Draft and screenwriter. I, I, I can't stand Final Draft. I, I like screenwriter, but, but oh, you like screenwriter? Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's a that's a that's a, a screenwriter argument. Yeah, well, I think it, it's whatever. Yeah, it's whatever resonates with you. Whatever helps you get it on the page. Oh, yeah. I, I'm 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 fussy about little technical details. Like I said, I, I, right. I, well, I'll tell you, I still write hand. I still write pen to paper, and then I and I write it as if it was looking like a script, and then I transcribe it later and write it that way. I I can't. This doesn't resonate with me. It's it's funny. I the the best class I ever took in high school was typing. And learning how to type was really everything. This is so I, for the most part, I can think like this, and it, it, and then it depends upon the nature of the keyboard. Different keyboards, some keyboards are just not acceptable. It, it's got yeah, to, they don't feel right. Everything has to flow from the fingertips through the yeah. keyboard. Uh, dialogue, yeah, a lot of dialogue gets written longhand. I don't know. It just it just naturally wants to go that way. I, it doesn't want to go that way. It wants to go this way. Yeah. I don't know why that is. It's a mystery. Yeah. I think once a writer, always a writer, you know, I just have, uh, you know, I, I always, I get some of the best scenes or lines just driving through the canyon here. I live out in Malibu and just, I'll start laughing to myself. And, you know, my son got used to me going, it's like, mom, are you writing a scene in your head right now? I'm like, yeah. I mean, you want me to tell you about it? <laughs> sometimes he said yes, sometimes he says no, but you know, I just start all these, you know, characters are having a, a, an issue or something's happening and then somebody said, I'm like, oh, it's perfect. I got to pull over and write this down. <laughs> so the first time we hired Sherry at Crip was for Billy Friedkin's episode on a dead man's chest. It's about a rock guitarist who gets a tattoo that's a little too lifelike. So we have Billy Friedkin directing the episode and it's we're now casting and you walk into the room. Yes. Billy. Yes, Daniel Allman was my manager. Uh, she used to be married to Greg Allman, Daniel Dell. She goes, she has do she still is a manager, D2 management. Um, she he got me in the episode. Yeah, she, yes, he's in the episode. And then I think I had suggested Steve Jones, and you guys hired him. Um we did. And uh and, and what did you do with, with your commission? <laughs> I didn't I never get commission. I never 
get the gig down. Oh. Sometimes I'll get a dinner or lunch out of something, but usually okay. not even that. Okay. So, so. so um, but I remember Danielle telling me, you know, be prepared. And I always, you know, I try to always be prepared. And I knew if I was going to read for somebody like William Freakin, I better be prepared. And I better be prepared to the point where if he throws other things at me, I'm ready to pivot and make those adjustments for him. Um, and, you know, immediate, one of my first big auditions that I ever had, I read for, it probably was Parenthood. At the time, they didn't tell us what it was, but I read for Ron Howard down in Miami, mm -hmm. right after I'd done Miami Vice. Um, Ellen, uh, oh, I can't remember her last name right now, but she brought me in the room. And I remember being prepared and Ron Howard thanking me for being prepared. What did you do to prepare? You know, I mean, well, first of all, I just also learned, learned the dialogue. You know, I learned all sides of the dialogue. So even if like, if the person reading on the other side of the camera dropped the line, I knew where to pick it up, you know, just that I was just, you know, I took it seriously. I, you know, I learned it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and was off script and ready to go. And then um, made some Once choices. an A student, always an A student, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I made some choices, right? So, and even right or wrong, I committed to those and and what they were. And I asked him, you know, what I mean. The character's name was Miss Vendetta, so I kind of knew that she was tough, yeah. right? Um, and and he 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 allowed me to just play, and then he brought me to new places in the room, and you know, he thanked me for being prepared, and he basically said, you know, you're Miss Vendetta, and and the casting director was not happy about that and so like hey hey that's not true we have other people to see other people are coming in oh, wow. you guys work out that i'm happy to do it i'm available <laughs> you know it's just so grateful you know and i always look at those experiences too and that you know even if you don't get the part the opportunity to read for william freakin or something is you never know what's going to happen and it's just awesome to meet people like that you know it's the people that are talented and like the Ernest impression, was well, amazing yeah, like, to work with. It, it's so true. The impression that you make today might not pay off today or yeah. tomorrow. It might pay off a couple of days or weeks or months down yeah. the road. But that's the point. Yeah, and you got to you got to show up. I mean, a lot of the movies that I did in Thailand, the action movies. I mean, listen, they're not the best movies. They're not bad movies. I mean, they're whatever. But I was able to keep earning a living and keep working at what I love doing. And and I worked with the same directors over and over again, because, you know, I don't mess around and make them more stressed. I know they have enough to deal with. I'm there to help facilitate what they need. The sex scene in On a Dead Man's Chest mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, Billy directed it rather forthrightly. He, um, <laughs> He really had had you guys going at it. Yeah, he was. Just, yeah, he was really pushing us. That was that was that was a rough that was a rough day. Doing any sex scene is is hard, you know. And then he wanted it to be raw and gritty and, and making, you know, the other actor getting upset, you know, and stuff like Yule. that. So Yule, Yule, was, Yule Vasquez. Yeah, Yule. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he wanted Yule to just get more and more agitated and <laughs> stuff. So. Um, he pushed us and he pushed us um, when I was there with Steve Jones, too, when I was like, you know, he killed her, like, you know, like screaming. You got to go deeper. Don't hold anything back. It's tough. You're vulnerable. People are, you know, you know, the camera's on, you know, other people are going to be watching it later. You know, you want to look good. Those are not never easy. <laughs> it's a work environment, but you're still naked and they're not. Yes. There's. There's just something in the power structure of the room yeah. that that that's that seems yeah. Th th there's just an oddness to it. Yeah, it's who you work with too. Yule was amazing. I mean, he's just a gentleman. With William, and I didn't expect this from William freaking either. I knew that his job wasn't to make me comfortable, and I accepted that. Huh. Right. Huh. I knew that his job was to get what he wanted out of the scene. Yeah. So I wasn't looking to him to make me comfortable. I knew enough that I was going to have to make myself feel safe mm -hmm. and comfortable and lean on Yule in that way that they were, we were, that he was just as vulnerable as I was in this. Indeed. Indeed. I didn't look at it as like, Oh, I'm the little girl. You know, I looked at it as like him and I are both vulnerable. We're both actors. We're both trying to emote something and give William something and William's job was not to make us comfortable. Hmm. Now, that may have changed in the environment of where we are now in filmmaking and, and with these um, 
The chaperones. The chaperones, yeah. So, you know, that all may be different um, now, but at the time, and I still don't think it's, you know, though I have directed sex scenes and I know that it's it's different um, the way that I did it, but that's yeah that's, I mean, style. That, that, that's something that that I, I definitely want, wanted to ask you about after watching you know there's a a, a very erotic you know scene yeah. that, in me and will with yeah. uh, patrick dempsey yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and mm. uh basically you know you, you have a co-director but you still are directing you this is still your yeah. vision for what you are seeing of of you the actress yes you you know you the director have a certain need for you the actors to do certain things yeah was that a different experience well first of all that scene was way more intense than what ended up getting um edited because i could not get it the rating that i wanted um that scene was way more intense and they made me kept cutting the scene and i kept having go to go back to the rating uh people and uh cut more out and cut more out and cut more out they were what calling they, it, what in particular did they want to they cut they had a problem with the gun the gun being used and they were calling it a rape scene and i was calling it a love scene so i kept saying what rape scene are you talking about i didn't shoot a rape scene yeah 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 um so in my mind we were just so far off because for me the characters were they that's how those types of people in the time frame of their life that's how they connected intimately and everyone connects intimately differently for i felt for those two people in that snapshot of what they were going through mm. that's how they had to connect so it was different you know um and did i direct it i mean i did call action and cut on those um it was very cramped and we shot on 35 so the camera's huge wow oh, yeah, the camera's yeah. massive of course that's 1999 <laughs> yeah so it's like you know you got this big old and we're shooting in my winnebago that was my winnebago that i owned you know and i was like i'm not cutting a wall out you know so there's like the camera's like just you know yeah. right there so it was the logistics of shooting that i mean you know if we had more money i probably would have just cut a, an rv in half you know, or built one inside of a set, you know. Alas. Yeah. Or now shot it on a on a red camera and not had a big 35 honking. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or whatever. Everything's different. I mean, even lighting. God, it's all LED lights. It's so simple now. In fact, they're, Marvel doesn't even, they shoot all their movies flat white light because they'll do all the lighting and post. That's so crazy. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's mad. It's madness. They've, uh, they've, 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 the inmates are running the asylum. But never <laughs> mind that. All right, we we keep we keep jumping forward. We're we're still at Tales from the Crypt. And okay. What are your other takeaways from working with 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 Billy Friedkin? Um. Well, I again, I feel like he pushed me, you know, emotionally just to get further, you know, and get comfortable, and get comfortable with the uncomfortableness mm -hmm. right i'm going to be really uncomfortable and push you to be uncomfortable but know that i have you like i got you kind of thing mm -hmm. um and just allowing myself to go there feeling grateful to have the job and and grateful to to play in that arena and just you know bring what i could to it uh not take it for granted it's a great episode i, I think it is too yeah and uh we we loved your work in it and when Thank we you. got to the only skin deep episode that bill malone directed yes i don't know that we had anyone else in mind but you we didn't <clears throat> i think Aww. we wrote it with you in mind and and it was it was always pretty much what we intended from the get-go oh my god uh, you know, i think we, i think we we all learned a lot from billy working with billy we had never worked with billy before Ooh. Yeah. And it was so it was a pretty interesting experience for us as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then when Bill Malone, who, who was who was a friend and, and we brought him in to direct an episode, um, I think we looked at each other and said, let's see if Sherry's available. I don't mm -hmm. think we even talked about. Let's bring in Sherry and some other people. I just said, let's see if Sherry's around. No, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, were you ever aware of that? 
No, I know it wasn't, but I, I, I know that I said yes. I know that if you guys call me, I'm going to say yes. Good thing, you know? too. Well, but it, that is a stone cold fact. It, it was it was never between you and anyone else. It, it was written with you in mind. Uh, you know, Dick Dick Beebe's script was was good, and we I think we we modified it just so. Bill's vision was spectacular. It was like the inside of the character and the outside environment were all so tightly connected. Uh, it is it was one of my favorite episodes. Oh, cool. Uh, and all my other favorites are ones that I I, I wrote, <laughs> you know, the Gil and I wrote. So, you know, uh, this is you better say that. a lot. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a combination for me of, of Bill's incredible vision. Mm -hmm. But that can't be very satisfying, work in that demolishing a dormant vegetable. I, it, or a it pumpkin takes me, fruit. It takes my breath away. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. that um, the, the, the challenge is that you do the whole thing with a another face on. Yes. I'll, I'll tell you, it, that became, for me, very free. Obviously. Hmm. Got quite a temper, um, Carl. That girlfriend of yours. As a female. Got set of lungs on her like Voice business. of America. You know, you kind of are either this ingenue or you're the, 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 the pretty girl, you know, or you're a character actor. A synthetic show with a corpse inside. You know, I don't want to always try to look my best. Like, I don't always want to eat good. <laughs> I yeah. just, sometimes I just want to unbutton that top button and eat some crap food and, like, be, feel bloated and gross and not always feel great. I know that doesn't sound attractive, but, you know, it's just in this business, it's like you me. always got to be a size two or whatever. Like, I mean, that at least was yeah, well, in that moment, in that time, right? It, it may have changed, the but there's Find still a little thing. Mind if you're have... Halle Berry, you're going to have to, you got to look, you know what I mean? You play a character or Charlize Theron, but you better then bounce back to your size or, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. It's so your brand. You get... It's it's your brand. And, and that's, yeah. that's an important part of how you're going to sell what it is that you're selling. So when you get to play something where I feel like yeah, that was my freest acting. Maybe I will. Because wow. I didn't so worry you about how my face you. looked or if this was the right Over. side you or, preference? you know, like that was my freest like time. I wish I could do more of that. I, I'd like to have the whole series of her. Just She's the main character. She's, she, she goes hunting every week. Yeah, and she could really own her. Hmm her sensuality and her sexuality both, you know, behind that mask without feeling judged because she was past the point of feeling judged, mm. um, which is another, I think, point of contention as a female is that you're always kind of having to hide or hold your se sexuality and your sensuality. Um, you know, guys can have swagger and all this, but a woman kind of has to walk that line. So for this character, I felt like she could just go for it. She is the alpha in every room she walked into. Yeah. And I love like just sitting on the counter and putting her feet up and, you know, sucking on the cherry. It's like, you know. The, from the first moment that we meet her, she owns the room. Yeah. Yeah. But again, the, she is her. Is, yeah, and the she—I mean, the, the she is, is you. It's her. The she is you, and it's really—it's the way that you sat on that counter, and really, it's—it's it's the way that you own that camera. Oh, thank you. I appreciate uh, that. You know, here's here's a dirty little secret from producer to to actor. Me personally, I'm, I can't speak for Gil. I, of all the actors I've ever hired, I never ever hired an actor to act. I never wanted an actor to act. Acting is the stuff that's going to end up on the floor. The camera will see you acting and the audience will see you acting. The, what we really rely on is for actors to be as honestly as they possibly can. It's that nakedness. And the more emotionally naked an actor is willing to get, well, that's okay. That's where really that's what makes them great is their willingness to get that vulnerable so we can all well, well for the benefit of our of the story that, that we're watching mm -hmm. so hey aside from meryl streep and a couple of english actors who actually disappear into a role 
really that's not the point of the exercise it we really i've always hired actors to be who oh, they are as amazing. honestly as they possibly can and it, that that you suddenly were were liberated by not having to worry about this in particular because it, now it's all it's all the subtext yeah and that i think is what makes that episode so chilling <laughs> is that you know the, the, it's subtext, so nothing is ever you know banging you on the head. You have this, this, this. Oh, it's so, it's so creepy. Yeah, it's so atmospherically uh, uncomfortable. And yet, the the character sitting in the middle of it is completely comfortable within her own odd skin. Yes. <laughs> and and that I think is is the the secret sauce to the episode. It really is the, the, the Zen that you put at, at her center. That even when it does get violent, mm -hmm. the violence almost is part of the setup for the Zen. Uh, it, it's almost part of, it, it's almost scripted. It's like part of a menu. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta get through this course to get to that course. It, it almost justifies that final move with, with the knife when off goes his face. <laughs> so it, creepy. There, it, it does contain, I think, what, one of the best puns the Crypt Keeper ever, ever did when, when he talks about your character and I says... I guess that's one way to wear a guy out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was one of my few contributions to the episode was, was that joke. How long did it take to put the mask on every day? I don't remember. A long time. A long time. You know, we're still working with Todd Masters. Are you? He's so yeah. great. Are you guys doing more Tales from the Crypts or something else? Or? Oh, no, that's a whole other. Well, we, we are, we're, we're actually about to go to, to into the marketplace with a show called Are You Afraid? Oh, OK. And it's a, it's a, a serialized story, you know, like the, the streaming show like you'd see on Netflix. Uh, it's about flesh eating ghouls. Wow. Mm. And, uh, oh, if we get this thing up and, and, and running, your phone will ring, Sherry. Count me in. You know where to find me. Alas, we did not challenge you nearly so much when we hired you for Demon Knight. Though Demon Knight was hard for those contacts because I got really, my eyes got really messed up from wearing those oh, black right, contacts. Oh, right, right. That's right. Because you, that, that whole, the whole family gets demonized in the very beginning. Mm, yeah. Oh. You know, and I, had a, and I was so, I was a little bummed because I had more of a role and then, you know, I was, then when I, I went to the, with the Grauman theater, we had the premiere there and it started differently than how the script was with the girl in the bathtub or something now, or I think, mm. I don't remember, but it's, but a lot of my part was cut out. So then you don't really, understand why she's yeah. there you yeah, know yeah, 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 later yeah. which is That's fine right. i mean it is you know filmmaking you know i always say there's three movies one you write one you shoot and one you edit when i did me and will i had to cut michael debar out we shot all these great scenes with him and i love him as a friend and as an actor and he played the therapist but the therapy scenes were just bringing the movie down i just thought and i kept trying to cut him shorter and mm -hmm. then it just kept mm -hmm. choppy mm -hmm. and then i finally just cut it and so I sent him a basket of muffins and I said, you know, I'm sorry, you're going to be on the editing floor. And then he's like, you bastard, don't you know I'm off carbs, darling? <laughs> because not only do you cut me out, but you send me muffins that I can't eat. <laughs> oh, boy, just bad and worse. Uh, well, OK, I mean, we're we're there. I mean, do, do, there were other projects between Demon Knight and uh, when. But you let me just say what Demon Knight really fast, because sure, sure, I sure. really, really loved working with Ernest Dickerson. Like I just I loved working with him so much. He had such a way with the camera mm. oh, that I yeah. that I found in like when he had like Billy Zane. And Billy Zane and I found out we were born the same day, same year, like a, kind of like minutes apart. So we became closer. And um, that was just kind of fun that we, you know, our birthdays and we ended up having birthday parties later together and celebrating. But um, he he had like Billy Zane in front of the camera and then like the camera would run, would pull back and then he would have him run around the other side. So it looks like he disappeared and came back or, you know, but mm -hmm. he and 
I'm that type of person that if I'm on set, I'm not usually in my trailer. I like to be out and watch, you know, what, you know, it's how I learned how to produce. Well, what do you do? What do you do? Well, what do you do? Well, what do you do? Well, how long do you work? Well, what's that? That's a gobo arm. Oh, that's a great, Oh, what does that do? what's that for? So just watching Ernest, you know, kind of do his thing was so interesting. And I, and I thought he had such a, he made me think I shouldn't direct because I thought he had such a mastery of the camera and the way he could use the camera to tell the story better of tricks that I'm like, oh, my, my brain doesn't go that way. I think I'm really good at directing actors, right? But I'm not, I don't think I have a great like uh, handle on a movement of a camera as much as I would like to. Well, and I, I, work I, with, I would, I would, dis who, who directed that part of, of, of me and Will, who, who was responsible? Well, for, I mean, I, I did, I, I did. And I had, you know, I had help, but I'm just saying it's not like it doesn't, I really have to struggle to find there it. There are some great shots in that movie. Thank you. Oh my Thank God. You. Like the meeting. In, in her trailer, you know, you start and we're outside the, the window maker, then we move to, to the window and we're kind of watching yeah. through the window. Yeah, oh, thanks. That, that was a, that's a really nice shot. And we stole that shot because we parked the one, the RV up on Mulholland Drive. And then I said, okay, let's lay a dolly track down. They said, what, well, the cops come? I said, just keep shooting until they say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it, it, but it's a great <laughs> shot. It, it, yeah, it's it really shot. is. It, it's a terrific, Thank and it's you. a long, it's a long. Yeah, scene. yeah. It, Joey Foresight. Shot. She was she was amazing. She's a the DP. She was really great. I really loved working with her. Uh, another great shot uh, in the bar. It starts out tight on Jane's shot glass, and then yeah, it, uh, and then it becomes a great setup to the tight two shot. I'm sorry. What happened? I thought things That's were going good. That's another great shot. There's great storytelling. Whatever you were thinking as you were watching Ernest, you you were very you were an A student. For fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah. uh, one last shot that, that is really super is the discovery of the bike. Oh, yeah. At, at, M. Emmett, uh, at, at M. Emmett Walsh's uh, garage. I love him. He's so great. He is so great. Uh, wow. Yeah, I love the reveal. First of all, I love that motorcycle. Love that motorcycle. And is, I, I. Is that the real motorcycle? The real motorcycle does not exist. Okay. okay. Uh, it's There's been a dupli duplicate, and I okay. actually saw it again recently huh very oddly during covid um it was in a warehouse space in agora hills and i was at a doctor's appointment and i walked and then i saw something out of the corner of my eye and i took two steps back and i went am i is that i walked in i looked through the window and it was um it's a temporary place where they have a uh, easy rider magazine who now owns those motorcycles. So they had both motorcycles from the thing. And I was like, can I come in and take, sit on them and take pictures? And the girl was like, yeah, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm crying. Like, you know, I'm calling Melissa, I'm like crying. Man, America by I was having such a bad day. I can't believe I'm seeing this. Like, it's crazy. But um, yeah, M. Emmett Walsh is great. And I love that. You know, I love the idea of freedom and motorcycles and, you know, just being able to take off and, you know, people, I, I still ride and people say, oh, do you want to go riding with me? I'm like, no, <laughs> the point of, the point of riding is to be by myself. You know, <laughs> I will ride with some people occasionally, but it, it's, that's not really why I ride. As, as a, as a, as a non-motorcycle person at all, I, there's one question I, I, I just got to know the answer to this. All right, on a on a hog, you know, the arms are up like like this. Yeah, that, that cannot be comfortable. Well, I my bike is For a my long bike, period of time. My bike, my, guys yeah, go down the highway like that. I like at some point, really, your arms are going to hurt. Yeah, they call the ape the ape hangers, right? So, um, I, my, mean, I just I have straight bars, so mine are out like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, I understand that, but yeah. but I mean, I, I just want to understand. I mean. That does hurt, right? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, that wouldn't be it hurts. That wouldn't be my choice. So, what was the process of getting me and Will up off its? No, in 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 into uh, well, getting it made. Geez, let, let's go there. That was, I mean, that was a very long, uh, arduous process. Um, it started with a, a flickering of an idea of 
two women on motorcycles, um, just riding around town, Melissa and I, for a long time, I didn't have a uh, car. I only had a motorcycle. Um, I went to many auditions with, well, at first there wasn't a helmet law, so I didn't have a helmet. I didn't ride a helmet until they insisted with the law that they did. And oftentimes I would leave my house without it because I would forget it. Um, but then I would get there and have to look like a girl. So then I would go in the bathroom and take off the boots and take off the jacket and throw on a dress and, you know, start whipping stuff out of the backpack to start putting what I call girl ready. So then I get girl ready and then go into the audition and then go back and then, you know, get so I can ride on my bike again. Mm -hmm. Um, and just the impact that I saw when I would ride, and then especially when I would ride with, with Melissa, people would just stop us and look at us and talk to us, you know, and it had this impact of two women on Harleys, you know, with long blonde hair that from our point of view looks like nothing and do shouldn't have an impact. It's just getting in a toy. doesn't matter. It's just whatever. It's just yourself. You know, why does that have an impact? What, why is that impactful? You know, what is that? And what if we did a movie where these two girls are riding? Why would they be riding? What would they be doing? How did they meet? What's the story? And I was always obsessed with Easy Rider. And uh, over over my time, I've been, I became friendly with Peter Fonda and Jack Nicholson and Dennis Hopper. I've only met a few times, didn't become friendly with him rode on the love ride which is a ride for muscular dystrophy with peter fonda and dwight yoakam a few times and just kind of had this community of riders and um it just was one of those things or what if they're looking for this captain america bike what if they like go on this road trip to and then we fill in the story so we just started writing bits and pieces of it um finally had a script it did the rounds um it went to all the different studios where I could get in and pitches almost everyone wanted it to be two men or that they had to be lesbians and there was a lot of lesbian movies coming out and they're like well we if you make the two girls lesbians I'm like well they're not they're into dudes um well if you make them guys I'm like they're not they're girls you know so it's like this is what it is so I started with can it just be two female friends it, yeah it, it, it wasn't that wasn't as you know sexy enough or whatever so I had a hard time finding the financing. So what I started doing was going to actor friends. The first person I went to was Seymour Cassell. And I said, you know, and I had met him through Zoe and Zan Cassavetes. He used to come over and I used to have uh, like Thanksgivings and stuff at their home. And I met him through and I, you know, got became friendly with him. And uh, I said, you know, I was wondering, he goes, yes. And I go, well, you know, I know what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> and he goes, whatever it is, Sherry, yes. I said, well, I need you. I want you to play my dad in this movie. He's, yes. He goes, I told you, yes. Just sorry. use my name, tell anybody whatever you need to do. And then I went to Grace Zabriskie. And Grace, I had worked with on a video. Um, I forget what it's called. It was a, one of those, um, a video game. And you could pick who killed somebody in the end and tell the different stories. And we shot it all on green screen, but I became, she played my mom in that movie in that video. It was like a shot, like a movie. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got her attached. I asked Keanu to come do a day for me. Um, and then I just started putting pieces together. And then I put in my own money to start and opened an account at city national bank. And then I said, you know, and as a female, what I did was I went above and beyond what I thought anybody would want to see. So I had a script, a budget, a lined budget. I did, I was the line producer on it, of course, because of the numbers. And then I put a prop list together, a location list together. I mean, like I kind of broke it down where it's like, this thing's going with or without you. Do you want in? So I had some pretty big investors. Steve Bing was one of my financial investors. Uh, Charlie Sheen gave me some money. I, I I had so many meetings with so many people and I had to just walk that line, you know, whether I was serious, not serious. I also realized too, while I was getting this movie made, there was a lot of people that didn't think that I was going to go make this movie. Um, and so I decided to stop talking about making the movie and just make the movie. <laughs> and I, I gave myself a start date, my first start date. And I had so many little 
miracles that were starting to happen. You know, when you say like, you're going to do something and the world just starts opening up to you. Yeah. I had, yeah. I, had, yeah. I, had I had met Johnny Depp through the years and I wanted to shoot the opening of the scene at the Viper room. And so I'd called the manager and he said, no, absolutely not. You can't shoot there. I'm like, come on, Keanu's going to do it. He's going to, his band's going to come down. And, you know, I, I just need it for like six hours and, you know, no, you can't do it. So I was like, oh God, now how am I going to, what, how iconically am I going to open this movie if I'm not at the Viper room? So, and I just got quiet. I went out that night and I ran into Johnny randomly at a restaurant. And I said, I, I, I'm trying to open the movie at the Viper room. And, you know, I don't know why you don't want me to do that. He goes, well, what are you talking about? I never heard about it. And I said, well, he goes, of course, Sherry, just, yeah, pay the, flip the guy some money to put the lights on and, you know, and the guy to do the sound and yeah, it's yours for free, of course. And I'm like, okay, you know, so then I like, I had the Viper room. It was just like everything yeah. just in Panavision gave me a package, you know, with the lenses. Um, I got a really, I just, I figured if I couldn't raise the money, I needed to get free stuff and when i you know i just i kept attacking it from both angles yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you know yeah. um and i got i ended up asking um mick jagger who i introduced to steve bing if he would give us a song for the rolling stones he gave me two songs to pick from that i could get for free mm -hmm. um and then i went to all the other musicians like rancid dwight yokum casey and the sunshine shine shine, shine ah Casey and the Sunshine Band yeah, through Steve yeah. Nemeth through their Rhino catalog. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, you just match whatever I paid the Rolling Stones. And they're like, okay, uh, what'd you pay the Rolling Stones? Nothing. <laughs> so then it became, I got a free soundtrack. Um, you know, but I had a lot of angels that helped me, you know, and, and a lot of people that just stepped up and, and, and did it. And I made sure I was always first one on set and I was the last one to leave. But you, you, you understand the reason that you had angels is because you did all the groundwork to put all those angels in place. They didn't just fall from the sky because, oh, you're Sherry. No, no, no. You had done all the, all the groundwork. You, you yeah. you'd walked into every room you ever walked into prepared. Yes. And I so did. people people will treat you quite differently when they there's just a, a feeling of of trust that you know what the fuck you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. It's simple, really. Yeah. Uh good lesson to be learned for our viewership because the, the you know, people out there trying to make movies, it, it, in a lot of ways it hasn't changed at all since when, you know, you made that movie or we made our first movies. You know, it's still about preparation. It's still about collaboration. And it's still about, you know, being prepared, mm -hmm. and knowing what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, making sure that you have the right people who do know what they're doing to to help you. You have a certain amount of time and a certain amount of money. Yes. And once they run out, you're done. If you, yes. if you hit the ground without preparing, you will run out of both long before you're ready to. Yes, I love that expression, you know, but uh, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. You know, I always think that way going into making a movie. Well, and I always think, I always try to think 10 steps ahead. Like, okay, if I get to the Viper room and the back, I would, I, I, two in the morning, I go to the guy. I'm like, so tonight, tomorrow morning, we're coming at five, in three hours. For sure, this lock will be off so I can bring the big truck down, right? Yes. I'm like, for sure. No one's going to lock it. And if someone does lock it, who can I call to get it unlocked? No, it'll be unlocked. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be able to sleep. I got to, you know, so I just always kind of think and think and think like what could, what could, what could, what could, what, and then try to get in front of it constantly as a producer. The, uh, it's funny. There, there, there are a couple things that, that I, I learned from watching the movie that, that I, I'm, is, is this true that if if you you put uh, feminine hygiene pads on on a motorcycle, see, is that is that true? I don't know. I think if you put any padding on anything, it helps you know your, the comfort level a little. Okay, you know there, there were certain <laughs> things I I saw that, uh, huh? Again, not being a motorcycle rider, it's just it's just not shit I think about. <laughs> but hey, Listen, if, if, oh, if you try it. it. Now, if, if, if you do try it, Alan, I won't think any less of you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question that, that came up as I watched the movie, 
is there really such thing as a French whore shower? Um, you know, I've heard other people say that. And, yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. I've heard, you know, I think I've heard. I mean, there certainly is that way to have to just freshen up on the road. Oh, no, it, it, it's, it's yes, yes, yes. It's I mean, the, the two characters in the bathroom are doing something that, that everyone has done at one point or another in a bathroom. Like, oh, my God, what the fuck am I doing? But it was the description of it. I, I don't know. I laughed halfway through the scene just hearing that combination of words, French whore shower. I don't know. It just made me laugh. <laughs> When when you said that you after making me and Will that you 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 decided to to not pursue that road and you wanted, wanted to be a you know a, in a punk band instead get all that but oh man I, that's a, a, a that's a woulda shoulda coulda road and and I don't know what you're doing in your life at this point but you have incredible mad skills as a as a movie producer director writer you're you're really good at this. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I feel like, you know, the movie would have been better received even now, you know, and I also, you know, we talk about when the money runs out, the money runs out. When it came to post-production with editing, mm. I was out of, I was out of money mm. and uh, I would have re-edited that film. And I've thought about going back and doing a director's edit and re-edit it, but I don't really like to look backwards, you know, on things. It doesn't excite me to look backwards on things, it, it, it excites me. Um, but in the in these last, I've been right. I've been doing a lot of writing. I, I've written a, a series which is going to be very very hard to get off the ground. I don't even want to talk about it yet until I, it's further in. But I've been developing it for years. Um, I've written a movie uh, with a partner called Left Field. It's a kids baseball movie, um, and I have the money for that now. And the tagline on that is "When life throws you a curveball, hit it out of the park." It's a very sweet kids baseball movie i may direct that unless i find someone that i think is more qualified or that could have a better handle on it than me um and then i written a movie called christmas puppy so it's a very sweet little movie um and i have a horror movie that i wrote called chiggers so i just i have some things that i've written that are now kind of getting ready and percolating and i'm raising funds for and seeing where they go I like to kind of make them in house. You know, I don't really like to just write a script and sell it and farm it out. You know, I like to kind of see it come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking for, you know, different partners. I just came back from Sundance and met with a couple of different people on, on the different projects. So we'll see. Like I said, I finally feel like I have that time now that my son's off in college and doing his thing that I can, my, I can lend myself back to that you stepped away from the movie business to, to be a parent uh, yeah i mean i i tried to as when he was little i tried to keep doing i did sons of anarchy while he was young mm -hmm. he came to set i did a few movies in alabama alabama um and i remember one morning i had to wake up and uh i forget which movie it was i did two or three there while he was young hmm. and um I remember opening the curtain in the hotel and um, it was still dark out. And he said, I said, come on, you know, we got to get going. You know, the car's going to pick us up. And he says, well, mommy, it's not the next day yet. <laughs> and I said, well, it is the next day. The next day starts at 12 and yeah. it's now 4 a.m. So it is actually officially the next day and you can sleep when we get to the trailer. But, you know, I had to be in makeup at five to be on set by six. So I got to get up at four, you know, and um and he's just, I mean, he had a fun time at the, you know, uh, on, on set. That was a hor the horror movie I made there. And that was fun. Like, cause he gets to see all the stuff. What's he um, doing now for a living? He's, uh, he's, he's, he's going down the same road. It obviously, yeah. it, it didn't, it didn't bother him being there. It was, uh, yeah, no, he enjoyed it. And, uh, Sons of Anarchy, that was hard. Cause he was like four, three or four when I shot that. And, um, I didn't know if that, that, I did the pilot for that show and I didn't know what was going to happen with that. And again, the call time was super early and I didn't have a nanny or a babysitter or family member. So he just was rolled with me, whatever I was doing. And, um, but it got, it just was, it's hard. It was hard. I'm like, this is like, this is hard, <laughs> you know? And I wanted him to just have a stable, easy kind of, you know, life. Like I wanted his life to be predictable and um 
him wake up in the same bed and go to the school, same school and have the same friends and play sports. And he played baseball all through high school. He's a really good athlete. And uh, I wanted him to have that. And he did. And now he's doing great. And now, you know, I can, and hopefully maybe him and I will make a movie one day. Hey, that would be cool. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. There, there's something to, to contemplate. Yeah. I have one last question. Sure. Okay. One last question. And it has to do with some of the dialogue in me and Will. Okay. <laughs> and since you wrote the script, you know, there's, there's always even, yeah, we're putting them into characters mouths, but there's always, well, there could be an element of us in them. I mean, how much of, of you is Jane and how much of Jane is you? Um, there's a lot of it that's, that's based on my life, certainly. And then there's liberties that are taken and, oh, and, and changed, of course. Um, uh, let's not get loaded or used until we find the bike. Is, yeah. is something that, that, that Jane says it's the, it's the, or get used. It's, it's that, that sense of, of being used by people and, and knowing that you're being used. I mean, obviously that's something that, that, that I don't think you care for one bit no it, was there something reflective in that line because of, of when she says it it's really interesting it, you know what it was more of to use use drugs okay yes oh, but i like okay, okay okay all right but i like that interpretation and that could certainly be a, a part of of it especially once you see her codependent relationship she oh, has with patrick tempsey yeah yo yeah 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 yeah. uh secrets will kill you yes yeah i mean i be i believe that you know yeah. i think it's very hard to hold secrets you know i'm i'm an extremely loyal person and i will hold people's secrets for them um sometimes to the detriment of myself um, and I, uh, I grapple with that often. We're just too destructive together. I always found like, even when I was very young, I had certain friends and I said this to my son too. There's certain friends that kind of bring things out in you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's other friends, like, you know, I had my one group of girlfriends that just like, Hey, we got to get our homework in. And, oh God, we were not, you know, our parents said not to do this. And then the other ones are like, Hey, our parents said not to do this. Right. And it's like, yeah. Oh, it's like, so you have the, just the, they bring out that little naughty side to you or that side that maybe if you weren't with that person or hadn't met that person, you never even would have gone down that road. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those are great things. And sometimes they're super destructive things. Indeed. Last one. Okay. When I die. I'm, why am I, I sweating? <laughs> okay. When I die, I want to be buried in a dress. Uh, I, I, we don't know in the movie if she gets buried in a dress, but. Uh, oh, well, uh, we kind of do because, we you see do because she's laying out, out the clothes. Yeah, 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 we, that we, dress. We, we never actually see the funeral or anything, but, but yeah, there, there is, it is being laid out. All right. Uh, all right. It's a morbid question, but we're morbid people. Uh, <laughs> when when you die, Sherry, you want to be buried in a dress? <laughs> You're so funny. No, I do though. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I? I I don't. I I I haven't picked out my outfit yet. <laughs> <laughs> But I will give it some thought. Um, there you go, please. Um, but I'm, actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm selling insurance on this side. There's, there's yeah, right. The um, but that, I mean, it's a good question. I, you know, for for that character, um, she really never allowed herself. Sorry, I'm about to cry. Um, a, wearing a dress is a very vulnerable thing. Your body is exposed. Your, you know, and it. It's like hmm. she she finally wanted to allow herself to be vulnerable. Yeah. And just her life experience never allowed allowed it to, really. So it, it makes me sad for her, you know, for that. Oh God, I mean, she, what a what a hard pass. The in the dad character, man. Ooh, yeah, boy, the Seymour Cassell character. Yeah, 
there's a shot in the shower where it really, and everything is just yeah. implied where you see her feet and then his feet come in behind her. Yeah. Uh, wow. I mean, there's so much, there's so much said with so little. And there's, you know, her writing in her journal when she says hiding a bag of clothes in the bushes, you know, where her, you know, the intonation is that she always had to dress tough and like not be a girl and just, all that and everything had to be this hard front you know mm -hmm. and she just wanted to always she never felt safe enough and people she picked being you know people that she was picking in her life that were too destructive together and and maybe this character the will character finally allowed her that in some arena in in a way she would have been better had she had a little bit of of the character from uh, only skin deep inside of her <laughs> that 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 character's sense of self yeah uh and and uh that that came as clearly from you as 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 could be you uh thank you so much for having this conversation with us Sharon. oh thanks you guys i thought we were going to be on with a bunch of people and it wasn't just going to be about me so no this was always going to be about you you and nothing but you Oh, well, you guys, thank you so much. I'm really honored that you thought of me and, and uh, thank you for the jobs you've given me. I, I, I'm really, I feel so grateful. You were uh, one of the highlights in our career in Tales from the Crypt. I mean, that's why I don't think anyone else has done three episodes. Our, our work looked good because your work looked good. You know, it's, uh, it, this is, we rely entirely on each other. And, and uh, it, it is because you made our work look great that we kept going back to that well. Thank what, you. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, very grateful, and I'm still here if you need me. <laughs> oh, like I said, if, if if we can set this thing up, oh, your your phone's gonna ring, and, and you may never forgive us. <laughs> uh, and with that said, hey, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll uh, we will see you all next time. The How Not to Make a Movie podcast is executive produced by me, Alan Katz, by Gil Adler, and by Jason Stein. Our artwork was done by the amazing Jody Webster, and Jason Jody, along with Mando, are all the hosts of the fun and informative Dads from the Crypt podcast. Follow them for what my old pal the Crypt Keeper would have called terrific Crypt content.